what's up guys Sean the bro here and in today's episode we are going to be starting a little mini series on converting our 2.5d fighter game to a 3d fighter game so there's going to be a few episodes here based on movement animations camera work and other 3d elements that we need to adjust so right now this is our fighter template this is a project I've been working on for quite some time. You can take a look at the fighter template, which I'll link right here in the top right corner, if you want to check out how we've implemented everything in that series so far. This is strictly a 2.5D fighter, so we can go and attack our opponent, spawn our hitboxes, and do all that good stuff. Now, while this world is three-dimensional, we don't have the 3D elements of 3D fighter, such as Tekken. We can't go any closer to the camera or any farther away. We can jump and crouch move left and right but we can't move forward or move backward into the foreground or into the background that's what we're going to be accomplishing in this mini series so this is part one and for part one we just want to do movement very first thing i'm going to do is just add controls for the different movement types so moving into the foreground moving into the background allowing both characters to move this way and removing our constraints on our characters because right now in our 2.5d fighter our constraints only allow the characters to move left and right. They don't allow them to move into the foreground and background. So, right now, can't do anything. We are locked in place. I'm going to explain this later, so don't worry about it right now. Now, I've changed some settings on the back end to show you what it looks like for today's episode. So, I come into my game here and I can press a button or key. And my character can move into the foreground and into the background. That's player two doing that. And player one can also do this. And so at this point, they can kind of move around each other. Now, because this was a 2.5D game, if I go too far, I fall off the edge. The stages were not made with the intention of being 3D. Full arenas. That way they can walk around without falling out. Quick rundown before we hop into the episode. We are going to be going over the controls and the movement. Next episode on this, we are going to go over animating those movements. Then we will be going over the camera and making our stages 3D so we can walk around. And then we'll finalize things like hurt boxes, projectiles, and how all those things have to work together in a 3D world. So this is going to be a mini series, but it's still going to have quite a few parts to it to do this conversion. If you have been following the fighting game series that we have, then I recommend you make a backup or a copy. So this is my fighting game as of episode 222. You can do it earlier than this, or you could do it later than this, but regardless, I recommend that you have that backup in case something breaks because this is a major change, or if you decide you don't like the 3D and you want to go back to the 2D. So I have two different projects here in my source control. I have my 2.5D, and this is a separate one I'm having for the 3D movement. So the very first thing we're going to need is our actual inputs that we want to use to move the characters into the foreground and into the background. Now, in a true 3D fighter, it's not really that simple. Since our camera is not rotating around the characters right now, it is that simple for us, so that's how I'm going to keep referring to it. If we go to Edit and Project Settings, and then go to Input, we can add two new action mappings or axis mappings for our movement. This series is in 5.3 now, so if you want, you can use Enhanced Input instead. I don't have a reason to right now, so I'm still using my action mappings and axis mappings, but I do have episodes on enhanced input if you want to check them out. For today's episode, I've added two axis mappings. I've added one called Move Forward 3D P1 and Move Forward 3D P2. So for those that aren't too familiar with the series, I have P1 and P2 inputs. P1 is going to be first player on a keyboard and every player on a controller. P2 is specifically if you want to have a second player on the same input device. So if you want to have two players on a keyboard, so my controls for P1 are B and V. B is a scale of 1, V is a scale of negative 1, so they're just opposites. One is going to go into the foreground, one is going to go into the background. It could depend on your world orientation, so just keep that in mind. It might be different for your project. As long as they are opposite values, it doesn't matter what keys you assign to them. You can always change these keys later. Then for P2, I have the numpad plus and the numpad minus sign. Plus is a positive one, and minus is a negative one. Now, with our input set up, we can go to our code, and we want to go to the base player controller.h. Now, keep in mind that I have all sorts of red squigglies here. 
these are things you don't have to worry about right now so just ignore the red lines just the compiler hating me at the moment I have another video already scheduled to be released on how to fix this so if you're encountering what I am encountering you will be able to resolve it pretty soon watching that episode but ignoring that let's scroll down in our base clear controller to our move right function our call move right now at this point in the series the move right actually is called from the controller the controller can do other things than just tell the character to move right. It might be able to move us in the menus. It might be able to take control of a minion or something. It doesn't all have to be on the character. The controller is receiving those inputs from the player and passing them to the proper spots. So we had call move right. If I press right, I want the character to get that input and allow them to move right. Remember that move right is an input axis, so a value of negative 1 is moving left and a value of 1 is moving right. We want to do that same behavior for move forward. So I've called it move forward 3D just to make it not so confusing because forward typically refers to the direction that you're looking. And in this case, since the camera is looking at a different spot than the characters are, this term could be confusing. So this is move forward 3D. So I've made a new function which is u function blueprint callable, meaning we can call it from the blueprint. I've called it void call move forward 3D, and I have a float underscore value here because the input axis receives a value from the input device and passes it along through the function. Now, we also have a call move right controller, which isn't required, but it's something I set up if you do want to have specialized behavior for controller inputs. If you do, you can also add a call move forward 3D controller. This is likely something we will explore in the mini series anyway, so you don't have to do it right now if you don't want. But as long as you have one function that we can create in our controller, we're good to go. Now let's go to the base player controller.cpp. We want to scroll down to our setup input component function and we want to bind our move forward 3D P1 input axis. Now I have this check for setting up the input bindings where we were binding the move right P1 only if the player controller was the first index. This was just to avoid assigning the wrong input actions to the wrong player in keyboard mode. But since that occurs on input axes and we have move right in here, we want to make sure that we have move forward in here as well. Note this is only for the inputs on devices with more than one player on it. So you'll see move right controllers outside this if statement. Move forward 3D controller but also be outside this if statement. But anyway, I have input component, bind axis, and we're using our input axis name, which is move forward 3D P1. We're passing along this, which means this instance of the controller is what we're calling this function on. Then the function we're calling is going to be our new function that we made. So a base player controller, colon, colon, call move forward 3D. Now we have to create the function so we can scroll down. I'll scroll down to where call move right is. It's right here. So void a base player controller colon colon call move forward 3d float underscore value now we can fill this out but we don't actually have this function on the character yet so we won't be able to do that so let's take a step back and go to our fighter template character dot h now in here this is the same deal as the controller we have a move right function in here but we don't have a move forward function so we need to create that let's scroll down to where our move right function is And it's right here. It says move the character left and right using button controls such as a keyboard. I've added a new function today called move forward 3D. So U function, blueprint callable, void move forward 3D, float value. And it says move the character forward and backward in three dimensional space using button controls such as a keyboard. Simple enough. Now we have our function. We can go ahead and call it in the base player controller. So if we go back to our controller function, we want to make sure that there is a possessed pawn before we try and do this because if we try and call a function on a pawn that doesn't exist, we will crash or at the least we will get an error. If possessed pawn, so if the controller is possessing a pawn, we want to grab that possessed pawn and we want to call it move forward 3D and we're going to pass in the value from the controller into the character function for move forward 3D. Now the controller is set up so we can go to the fighter template character.cpp and scroll down to where we have our move right. Now move right is an insanely large function and we are not going to worry about all that today. We just want to make sure our inputs are actually working and we can move the character on this axis. This will be for the next episode. 
So ignore the vast majority of the logic in move right. If we scroll down far enough, you'll find the logic where we actually move the character based off of move right. And that is right here where we're adding this movement input. This one in particular is for the crouch, so the speed is halved, but it's not super important. What's important is that the way move right works is it calls the add movement input function and it passes in a vector to tell what axis we should move on, x, y, or z. And it gives the value or the rate at which we should move. We want to do that in our move forward. So let's scroll down below the move right function and create a move forward 3D function right here. Void a fighter template character, colon, colon, move forward 3D, float, underscore, value. In here, we want to add movement in that direction. So this could be either positive or negative into the foreground or into the background. But we want to call add movement input. We want to make an F vector. And this time, unlike move right, where the 1.0 was on the Y, if I scroll up, you'll see it. The 1.0 is going to be on the X. Remember, this is the axis we're going to move on. So on the X, this is the foreground and background. So this should be 1.0, the y should be 0, the z should be 0. The rate is the value that was passed into the function. At this point, we are ready to load up the editor again. Now the editor is open, we want to go to our base character BP. This is my character blueprint. So base character BP. In here, we want to make sure that we fill out the move forward 3D for player 2 as well for the keyboard mode instances if you are following that design. Simply enough, we can just search for our input axis of move forward 3D P2, and you'll get this node right here. Now, we want to make sure that our player 2 reference is set up correctly. This is something that we cover in the fighting game tutorial series. You probably already have this, but if you don't, basically just know we get the correct character in the world and set a reference to it. I'll go to it quickly, but I'm not going to explain all the logic for it. So you can slow that down, pause it if you need to double check it, but you likely already have that. So we want to get our player to reference and we want to right click on it and convert it to a validated git. This allows us to check if it's valid before using it. This means we won't get errors or crashes from it, even if it's invalid. Then we want to grab the actual controller. That way we can call the controller function. And then we want to cast to base player controller. And if it's valid, we will go into this cast and then we'll call move forward 3D. We should have an axis value on here and we want to pass that into the value on the function and that's how you get what we have right here. The very last thing we need to do is actually set the constrain to plane to off or to false because we don't want to constrain this character to a plane anymore. We're going to do this a little bit more elegantly in the future, but just for proof of concept in today's episode, we can go to our base character BP, class defaults, and search for constraint. There will be a planar movement section with a constrained plane field. This constrained plane field was enabled because we were constraining the character on the x-axis. That way they could not go into the foreground or background, which is what's wanted in the 2.5D fighter. You can disable this by unchecking it so that it doesn't happen. And of course, at that point, we can then move on that plane or move on that axis, I should say. And when we come into our game here, I should be able to press the buttons I assign to V and B and plus and minus to move my characters on that axis. Very rudimentary right now. That's why this is a mini series though. It's going to be covered over multiple episodes. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed. If this video helped you begin converting your 2.5D fighter to 3D and you'd like to see more, please subscribe. It does more for myself and the channel than anything else you can do. I just really appreciate it. I want to give a huge shout out to my YouTube membership, Patreon supporters. Discord supporters, all of you that asked for this type of video, thank you guys so much, and I really hope you enjoy it. If you ran into any issues while following this episode or any of my tutorials, feel free to join the Discord community. So thank you so much for watching. I'm Sean the Bro, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, guys.